Um, I hope that everyone had a great sleep and is ready to really focus and make the most of our last day. Um, and also everyone is stocked up on coffee or tea as needed. Yeah? Yeah. Great. Um, then I'm going to hand this off to Oviora for our official welcome and introduction, but I think hopefully all of you will be very excited for all of our speakers today. Yay. I want to just want to read a brief uh, bio of uh, James uh, Zaniolo. Right. Uh, James Zaniolo is the president and founder of Better Solutions, and uh, a boutique executive search firm specializing in association and non-profit ventures, as well as co consulting. Zaniolo uh, possesses a unique understanding of the executive set process. They develop through uh, more than two decades of position, ranging from non-profit uh, executive direct director to uh, publisher of the leading tool for non-profit executive search. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we have been welcoming to this event, uh, Jim uh, Zaniola. Try not to trip while I'm up here. This is great. It's sort of cut my head off, so whoever's watching won't get to see this. Um, but good morning. Thank you all for actually showing up on the last day of your session. I know that's one of the toughest. Um, we're going to be sort of all over the place today, and one of the ways I think this session works best is when you jump in as often as possible. So um, we're going to talk about talent management, talent recruitment, uh, talent retention. And so if there's something going on in your own organizations that you want to talk about, uh, jump in and let's address it, because sometimes that's the best way to learn. Um, I'm going to start talking today a little bit um, without the screen behind me, because <clears throat> the slides that we've prepared focus a little bit more on uh, recruitment than on uh, sort of starting a few steps back at managing the talent you have. Um, but I wanted to go around the room just real quickly and have each of you tell me just a little something about yourself so I know who I'm talking with this morning and what uh, you'd love to get out of this session. Or if you don't uh, have an answer to that question, what's the sort of biggest takeaway from the last few days? Good morning. Uh, I'm Sime. I'm the school of Hassan, serving uh, in Hassan, an organization based in DC, working towards conflict resolution between Australia and Turkey. I'm responsible for international projects, mostly uh, youth. Uh, well, uh, talent management and discussion recruitment is very interesting for me today because I'm going to recruit participants for my project uh, in coming spring. Uh, I have uh, I want to get some tips <laughs> to make it most effective. Work. Great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joika. I'm starting with uh, Habitat for Humanity. Um, I go primarily on research based stuff, so I, I do not really want to recruit someone at this point of time, but uh, hopefully in the new future, uh, it's going to be happening. Great. Hi, my name is Joika. I'm a business called Hello from Nigeria. I'm serving for the International International. And here I focus on productive health. I'm okay. Hopefully, you know, the vision today is best practices, what has worked, and how can I recommend that we go back? My name is Luis Guadalajara, uh, I'm from class, class 9. Um, I'm serving at the VLSM and I'm going to wrap up the audio sessions in part 3 that have to be more. Um, a good, uh, a human, an human. I'm uh, Dave Moss, I'm from Water Domain, and this is a top right of the tremendous amount of so I'm going to get into the, I guess, the basics. Also, I'd love to be doing a lot of film and television work, so.
today's interns, tomorrow's leaders. Good morning, I'm Kelly Rito, the Senior Director at Atlas Corps, and I'm actually responsible for talent management and recruitment for Atlas Corps. Um, and I'm interested in uh, hearing a little bit more about what might be on the cutting edge in the sector, and also how we might be able to apply this to fellow level recruitment. Um, yeah, amazing talent is there now, I think that there are others just like you in the country that they haven't um, connected with yet. I'm wondering how we can apply it that way as well. You should be up here doing this. <laughs> I may drag you up. I'm <laughs> Emily, I'm the program manager at Officer, and um, a lot of what I will be doing will be focusing on a new program with student and civil society leaders, as well as the host organizations that will be partnering with them. Um, so I'm interested to, to learn a bit more about kind of creating a good system fit. Yeah. And morning, I'm Abby Flanders, I'm the Chief Development and Engagement Officer. And <clears throat> I'm interested, I was probably interested in learning about the new dynamics and how to better work with people and inspire people. I'm Ron Flower, I'm the ISC manager. I don't have any talent management um, responsibilities right now, but I'm going to absorb everything you tell me about it. Perfect. <laughs> A lot of my job is talent, but it's not to be mentioned in the internet or in the social communication. So I have to be in the field and also talk to the company. So it's very hard to get passions. You don't have to specify they have to be locals from that area. So I can see them more about the talent. That's going to be the toughest part this morning. But we'll see where we can go with that. Hi, um, my name is Ronan. I'm an outsource fellow from Sudan, serving at Susan G. Uh, what I'd like to get out of this session today is um, pretty sure that everybody has to talk about how do we, how do we best you want to do this talent in a way that. Hi, my name is Dovira. I'm a last couple from Nigeria. Uh, presently serve with the Association of American Medical Colleges. So uh, we're designing uh, a very mobile program that, uh, that we hope to uh, mobilize healthcare professionals from all over the world to kind of interact with themselves. And we intend to pick the best. You know, we just can't pick everybody. So I look forward to learning to one or two things for some uh, hi, my name is Jasper. Uh, I'm from Norway. I'm also an intern, working mostly for Abby. I'm Abby now. So she's taking care of me. Um, I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say. I think it's a very important topic and it's very relevant for almost every organization. Hi, I'm Dipanita. I'm an Atlas Core Fellow from India and I'm serving as the training manager at Atlas Core. Um, I'd be really, really interested to find out within, within the startup space, what should you look for in your founding team members? Because there's very high attrition rate, so just to find out how to do that. Perfect. So, talent management, talent retention, and talent recruitment all starts with knowing who you are and knowing who you are really well. Because unless you're comfortable with knowing what your strengths and your areas of weakness are, um, it's going to be hard to recruit a winning team. And sort of one of the benefits of recruiting talent is you can sort of fill in the gaps that maybe you're not quite so strong in. So I say all of this starts with a critical self-assessment. What do you love to do in your role? What don't you love to do? What do you do well? what don't you do well, and how, as you create other roles on your team or in your organization, can you perhaps give some of that responsibility away so that you can focus on your core strengths and the areas that you enjoy the most. I think this is critically important in a startup team. Um, and one of the things I say that all of this begins with is you need to have a great attitude. Um, if somebody comes to the team with a great attitude, you can almost always teach them anything. They don't have that attitude to be a team player, to be a positive part of what you are doing. 
no matter how talented they are, they're just not going to be a fit. So we'll talk a lot today about um, personal strengths, personal characteristics, um, more so almost than technical experience. Um, and I'll sort of relate this to something that I've gone through in the last few years. So um, I'm, uh, I spend every day focused on helping nonprofits recruit talent. And that starts with what are we looking for? What is the role? What's your organization? What's your organization's brand? Um, but two and a half years ago, I launched this company and I had to sort of figure out what it was going to be, who we were going to be, how we were going to approach it, and who was going to be a part of the team. And I was at another company for 10 years prior to that. And um, while there's a lot that I did really well, when I sort of started to look at myself, the thing I didn't do well was manage and develop people. And so here I was getting ready to launch my own company, and if I couldn't get that right, we clearly weren't going to be around very long. And that was a really tough realization because I knew that I had a great track record in recruiting uh, people for other organizations, but on reflection, I didn't have a great track record of retaining the talent I recruited to work for and with me. Um, so spending time on um, all of the things that make you happy, that you do well, and that you want to do, and looking at what you don't want to do or what you're not yet able to do as you grow yourself professionally and personally, but again, as you add to your team. Um, I've found that <clears throat> every time I add somebody to my team, I try and get it so that I can get back to focusing on that which I love, because if I can focus on business development, if I can focus on working directly with the clients, and if I can focus on recruiting talent for it, versus accounting, versus our website, versus um, reports for the clients, then everybody has a better experience. Um, so in each of your organizations, whether you're um, going to be recruiting talent shortly, or whether you're going to be recruiting talent a long time from now, spending time every year on your own sort of personal development plan, I think, makes a big difference. I also thought my jacket would make it on a lot longer, but... <laughs> maybe it's just because I'm talking about myself and I hate that. So maybe this will go back on. I apologize. Um, pardon me. And then you've talked a little bit about recruiting talent in different ways. So there's the talent on your staff, there's the talent that will volunteer for your organization, and it's just important to get it right in both areas. So. At the end of the day, talent becomes an ambassador for you at some level, whether they have a public role or not. If it's somebody who's going to tell your organization's story or raise money or be your visibility in the field, um, you've got to start with understanding who they are as a person. So again, regardless of the technical skills and experience you're looking for, who are they as people? Um, when we design a recruitment process, we design as much, if not more, of the time to be spent on just a conversation. Who are you? What do you like to do? Are we going to get along? Because we're going to spend a lot of time together if we hire you as a volunteer or as a staff person. And the, we're all going to have a better experience. And the organization is going to be more successful if we all enjoy working together. The worst thing we can do is have a team of people who really care passionately about the organization but can work together. So I suggest spending as much time, if not a lot more, on the personal side. Um, and that can be hard sometimes in an interview setting. That can be hard um, because folks aren't always comfortable talking about themselves. So you've got to create a platform where they are comfortable. I don't interview at a table. I interview in sort of a, on two chairs almost like a living room setting. To the extent that you can do that, it doesn't set up that sort of, sort of formal divide. Um, so sometimes it might be a coffee shop. Sometimes it might be just the office, but again, it's arranged with couches and chairs. Anything you can do to put the other person at ease as you're interviewing them, the better, um, because you'll get that much more out of them. Um, we do the same thing when we're doing CEO searches. We put the search committee, which is a group of volunteers who are as nervous as the candidates, in a living room setting um, to make them relax, to help the candidate relax, and um, to get the best conversation. It's not an interview. It's not an inquisition. It should be a conversation. Um, so we spend a lot of time 
designing the process, but we also spend a lot of time designing the dynamics around the conversation. I'm going to stop there for a moment just to see if there's any questions. Talent management and human resources. So human resources is the broadest uh, term. So that will be uh, everything from how do, what type of talent do we want in the organization and how do we recruit it, to now that they're here, how do we ensure they have a career path, how do we ensure that they grow, uh, to uh, ensuring a workplace environment or culture uh, that is conducive to the work that we want to achieve, but also a place that people actually want to come to work every day. It also includes things like compensation and benefits under the human resources umbrella. So human resources would be the broadest term. Um, and then, in, and so I guess the bias that I bring to this is I've always been on the talent management side, not the broader recruitment side. Um, but the HR is sort of the broadest term. And obviously, that would be Right, and exactly. And in some organizations, they're too small. They don't even have a dedicated human resources person. So the CEO might play that role. Sometimes it's the finance person who plays that role. Sometimes it's sort of left to everybody. Other times there's a dedicated HR person. Sometimes there might be an outsourced recruitment partner. Um, we'll talk a little bit about all of that, but it looks a little different in every organization. maybe a little bit differently. Part of me says an organization that doesn't present its true self in the hiring process, in the recruitment process, isn't an organization that really ultimately cares about talent. It's easy for me to say because I get to go into organizations and work with them to uh, help them figure out how they're going to recruit. And so when I'm involved, I spend a lot of time on saying, let's put our best foot forward. This isn't about getting somebody. This isn't about making the difficult, the interview <coughs> difficult or negative. This should be about you being honest as an organization about who you are and what you want and presenting that to candidates because my philosophy is a candidate doesn't have to accept a job offer. We want them to want to accept the job offer. So for a group that really believes in being honest in the interview process and structuring it in a way that you get to know as much about us as we do about you, I think that's the best process. There are organizations, however, that you're right, don't honestly and authentically live that. Um, and spending time, we'll talk about this a little bit further in the presentation, on understanding the organization's culture before you even show up for the interview um, will be helpful. And there's ways to do that. But knowing a little bit more about the organization's culture will help you understand what you're getting at the interview. Are you getting somebody who really believes we're a team and we're all in this together? Or are you getting somebody who wants you to have a great experience in the interview and then you get the job done and you find out that he or she is very, very different? So it used to happen in my uh, former employer with me. I'd sit there and I'd interview people and I'd be incredibly charming. And people would go, this is great, I want to come to work for you. And then they'd come to work for me and they'd hate it because I wasn't as confident in my ability um, once they were there. Uh, I wasn't at, I didn't manage myself as well as I could have to help them be successful. And so it was less than a positive experience because I wasn't as well rounded as a manager. So sometimes organizations need to spend more time with whoever's doing the hiring, teaching them about the role they play in hiring. And unfortunately, bless you, 
all too often they're trying to do too much or do too much too quickly that they don't take the time to properly teach that. So there's no easy way to fix that in an organization that hasn't spent the time or resources on uh, training or educating their talent on how to be better leaders, to be better managers, and to be better recruiters. But I would suggest those that get it right, I think they do have a great reputation in the community and you can find that. Those are the ones you want to gravitate towards when you're looking for work. And quite frankly, as you think about recruiting talent, thinking about what's going to set you apart, what's going to make somebody who you interview, whether you hire them or not, walk away and say, that was a great experience, I hope I get the job, but even if I don't, I'm so thrilled that I was there because they treated me well and they were authentic. Something we spend a lot of time talking about, I'll touch on today, but we won't talk about a lot, which is an employer's brand. So when you're looking for employment, people will talk to you about helping you or talking about your own brand. Who are you? Um, what are you presenting to the employer? But not enough organizations think about their own employer brand. What do they offer you, the employee, potential employee? What do they stand for in the community? What are their values? Uh, and how do they articulate that? How do they live that every day? But again, before going in for an interview or before sort of creating your own recruitment strategy, thinking about what your organization's brand is and how you talk about that in the advertisement you place, in the position description you create, in each of the interviews that you conduct, uh, and how you help individuals see that, um, I think is critically important to your ultimate success. I don't know if that helps, sir. No? <laughs> Other questions? I have a question. Like, normally when people uh, are being hired, they're, they're being hired by the department the boss or the department manager. What's your opinion? Should the colleagues also be present in the interview or at least have their opinion on the candidate? Because mostly it's not the boss who works with the <laughs> newcomer, it's the colleagues who are sharing office or sharing the work. It's a good question, and it's a really tough question because I have very strong reactions to that depending on the setting. Um, so if we're doing a CEO search, um, I'm much more comfortable if the senior staff don't meet the CEO because most of the time the senior staff forget that it's the board's decision, not their decision. And they always go to, well, we know the organization better than the board does. And I do believe there's some truth to that, but the reality is you don't know at that very moment in time what the board really wants in recruiting a CEO and that they may want something very different than the boss you just lost that you loved. Um, but they want to go in a different direction, they want a different skill set. This is their opportunity to do something different. So sometimes senior staff being involved in CEO recruitment is very difficult. It also becomes very difficult if you have internal candidates for that spot because almost always, you're going to prefer the person you know to somebody you don't know. But I would say in the nonprofit sector, more so than the association sector, and even in the corporate sector, uh, senior staff teams are being included at some level. It's usually the two semifinalists. It's clearly set up that you are not selecting candidate A over candidate B. You're offering the board some feedback on their strengths and their areas of question. Uh, unfortunately, again, sometimes staff say it's so sort of tilted, if you will, that it's clear who they prefer. And when staff sort of step out of that role and suggest that we prefer A over B, and then the board hires B and not A, the staff say, well, you didn't even listen to us, you didn't value us, why did you include us in the process? So it can work, it just has to be very carefully structured, and more importantly, there has to be a great relationship of trust between the senior staff and the board for that to work. That's the ideal. Sorry? That's the ideal if there is trust. Exactly. Um, if we're looking at a senior staff spot or a director or a manager role, uh, I think there can be much more involvement of others on the team and within the organization. And I quite frankly think that particularly as we look at recruiting those in their 20s and 30s, they want to know who their peers are going to be. They want to know what it's really like to work there. They want to see what level of social function there is in the job in addition to the actual formal part of the job. Sometimes you can get some of that online because there's so much more there than there ever used to be. 
Um, but I do think that um, organizations are more comfortable at the um, manager and the director level involving others in the organization. Again, I think human resources, or an absence of a dedicated human resources function, the CEO needs to spend time talking about, OK, here's your role. You're going to be a part of this interview process, but you've got a responsibility to represent us well. We still want you to be honest about your experience here, but at the end of the day, you're representing us to people that we're trying to recruit. So I think it can work, and I think where a formal process is structured, not too structured, but where there's sort of education around it, it can actually increase the value of the recruitment. I think for a lot of reasons, Skype is an important part of the recruitment process. I think, however, you need to take it with a grain of salt. So I do this a lot because I'm fortunately or unfortunately on the road all the time, and so I can't do as much face-to-face -face as I'd like. Um, and most of the times, particularly if it's a CEO search, I'm actually dealing with somebody who's never done Skype at all, let alone a Skype interview. And so when I set this up, I say, take a deep breath, relax. I'm not great at Skype interviewing either. You've never done one. We're just going to make the best of this. And I sort of allow for the fact that Skype isn't going to be perfect. Others, on the other hand, aren't comfortable. I, mean, I have some clients where it's okay. We can't get him or her in from wherever on your time frame. Let's start with the Skype interview and the one hour time block you have in the next two weeks. But let's talk about what that experience is going to be like for you. And sometimes, again, we get them to a point where they say, okay, look, this will be 75 or 80% of him or her sitting in front of me. And I can deal with that. Um, but unless you do a lot of sort of education, both with the hiring exec and the candidate, and particularly with the candidate to say, look, maybe you've never interviewed this way before, but we know that it's not perfect, ideal, or easy, you can make it successful. I would say I would probably not allow an organization to hire somebody they hadn't physically met before the end of the interview process, but I do think from a time perspective, from a cost perspective, um, if it's the right talent, um, then starting with a Skype interview is great. I think, quite frankly, some ways better than um, the, a telephone interview. I also think that for leading edge organizations, we need to stop thinking about, OK, we're in Washington, DC. Our talent needs to be in Washington, DC. Not everybody's there yet. Maybe a small percentage of people are there. Um, but I think the smarter organizations are going to say, it's about us recruiting the right talent. I don't care where on the globe they are. I want the best people. And particularly as organizations are uh, increasingly global, either in who their constituents are, how they're raising money, the way they're disseminating their message, um, they're getting more savvy about that. But I do think we have a long way to go. But as we do, we'll see Skype much more. Yeah? <laughs> Questions are much better than anything I'm going to say to you today, because it really gets to what you're thinking and what you're um, you really want to know, so trust me, as much of this as we do is great. Uh, one of the most difficult parts for me in, in any project I do is like a first recruitment, but the second uh, difficult thing is to say to people that they are not selected. <laughs> and I have always, <laughs> and I always, always have these doubts. Should I call them? Should I write them? Uh, how to make first less painful for them? And what is like the better way, writing or verbally? Uh, saying it verbally because uh, when you call and talk, uh, they normally open the conversation. Why? How? Which? Normally, I don't know. <laughs> so, what's your opinion on this? So, I'll take a little bit of a step back. I think if you want to be a world-class organization in terms of how you recruit talent, you turn people off, um, sign them off, you take them out of the recruitment process the right way at every stage. So when you get 100 resumes, and you know you're only going to interview five people, still sending an email to the other 25 saying, thank you very much for applying. We had a strong pool. We've selected others for an interview. Is something that most organizations don't do. 
Most organizations say, oh my gosh, we got all these resumes, we can't possibly acknowledge them. I would say you set yourself up as an employer of choice when you acknowledge those resumes because the candidate says, well, they at least care to acknowledge my resume and to let me know I wasn't a candidate. Because a year from now, you might be recruiting something for which they're perfect. Two, if you do a telephone screen, or if Human Resources does a telephone screen, and decides not to move somebody forward to the hiring exec, again, closing that interaction out either with an email or a phone call, but closing it out properly and timely, again, sets you apart from so many other employers. But I think when it gets to the hiring exec, and you've interviewed three people in person, and you've decided on your candidate of choice, I think calling the other two and saying, we had a great interview, it was a really difficult choice, but I hired somebody else, I think that's the best way to handle it. Now, HR is going to give you a lot of guidelines around what you can and can't say, and you need to listen to that. But again, the personal touch makes a difference. That individual might be a future employer of yours, might be a future employee of yours, could be a future donor of yours. And so every interaction makes a huge difference about how they perceive you and your organization. And if you get too many questions from the candidate, you can say, I'm really sorry. I wish I could give you more. Human Resources has asked me not to do that. I just wanted to personally reach out to you because I enjoyed the interaction so much. And that goes a long way. It really does. Okay. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, what do you think should be done in the entire process? It's a good question. Yep. That's a good question. I think recruitment should be done as quickly as possible. Because every day somebody's not in that job, you're losing money in some way, shape, or form. And it's not all money. You're losing visibility, you're losing messaging, you're losing infrastructure. But you don't want to do it so quickly that you miss the right talent in the market. So I think if we're talking about a managerial role, having that done from posting to selection in a month is still fast, but that would be ideal. Six weeks really should be the outside. At the director level, again, a month to two months. It probably does take two months. And some of that is because organizations are doing up to three internal <coughs> interviews before extending an offer. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, if it's a CEO search, it's going to take three to six months, and sometimes three months, quite frankly, is just too quick if there's a lot that you've got to sort of address or pull together or build consensus around in terms of what you're recruiting uh, and what your future direction would be. But I think particularly today where there's still great talent out there that's getting scooped up, the slower you move, the longer your search process is going to take because you know, you're at five weeks and there's somebody you really wanted to hire and she just got hired away by another organization, and now you may be starting all over, so it's another five weeks. So the quicker you move, um, and sometimes that means you've got to help HR if you've got a very busy HR department. If Human Resources is recruiting for 30 positions inside of an organization, um, that's not easy for them to manage. They're dealing with potentially 30 different hiring managers in the organization. Or if you're a 12-person organization and you've got two spots, again, it's a lot of additional work for human resources. So as the hiring manager, being clear about what you want, being open to seeing the resumes that human resources says, we've screened these folks, we think they're a fit here, we'd like you to see them, I think is important. But the quicker you can move the process, the better. Um, I was wondering what you think about so I don't think I've ever asked that question. Um, actually, I, actually, let me take that back. <laughs> when I'm interviewing candidates and deciding whether or not I'm going to present them to my client, I don't ask that question until I know that I'm going to present you to the client. And at that point, my client expects me to know everything about any candidate we're presenting, particularly if they're involved in any other searches. But when I'm hiring for me, I don't ask the question. Um, now, I guess some groups ask the question because they want to know, we really like you or we're going to lose you before we can make a decision. So I think there's some benefit to, are you in, have you applied elsewhere and are you in any other interviews? Um, because if you say to me, I'm interviewing with two other companies, and you genuinely are, 
and they're further along in their interview process, I might say, I want to get this guy back for a second interview before we lose him to somebody else. Uh, on the other hand, they, I might say, there's no way I can meet your other organization's um, hiring timeline, um, but let's stay in touch. So I think be honest when you get asked the question. Um, provide as much detail as you're comfortable with, but don't overdo it. Conversely, I get candidates who's, who I've got in a search and they'll say, well, I'm interviewing with two other organizations, or I've applied to two other organizations. This could speed up really quickly. And I say, that's great. When was your first interview? Well, I just sent a resume in. Okay, so you've sent a resume and you're not really in the interview process yet. Um, so it can work against you unless you're really honest about where you are with other organizations. I don't personally see it as an important question, uh, unless I'm managing the recruitment process and my client expects me to know that. But I don't see that it adds a lot of additional information. Yes? Yeah. Somebody with a history of maybe uh, drug addiction for like seven years, when you think about that, you know, kind of uh, out of that way in the position, I think every organization looks at background checks differently, and every organization conducts them differently. Meaning, some groups say, here's our candidate of choice, we're going to do a background check now. Uh, some say, here's my two semi-finalists, we're going to do a background check now, because all things being equal, we might go with the person who's got the cleaner background check. Others say, we've got a pool of six, let's do the background check. Um, at the end of the day, <coughs> I'm not an attorney, I'm not in the jurisdiction you're in, so law applies to what I'm about to say. Um, technically, in most places, you shouldn't use the background check as the deciding factor to hire or not hire somebody. So if a background check comes back and says, he's got a history of... Uh, drug convictions, or he's embezzled from his organization, or um, 20 speeding tickets, which have no bearing on your ability to do the job. But people react to all that stuff. Late payment on bills. Um, a big one now is um, bankruptcies or foreclosures, because that's a real reality for a lot of people today. Um, every organization addresses that differently. Some organizations say, I just want to know that he or she was not convicted of anything. Um, and then we can hire them. I don't care about what their credit looks like. Other organizations that deal with children, um, that deal with disadvantaged populations, say we have a responsibility to those we serve, that we can't have anybody who's not perfectly clean in every way, shape, or form. And that's when they get down to drug testing of candidates, fingerprinting of candidates, um, that's not a normal part of the majority of hiring, but for groups where part of it is direct service, it's a critically important part. And my guess is that in those instances, um, they're not the organization will extend an offer. We have some clients who um, have very strong technology infrastructure and platforms um, because they have large donor databases. And so one of the things that they would never admit to, but they use the background check very clearly. If somebody has financial problems, they will not hire them into an IT role at that organization because given that they're dealing with donors, very confidential information and financial information, they don't ever want a problem for the organization with their donors that would damage them in any way in terms of the information they keep on donors. So everybody looks at it differently. And, uh, information background check is other For example, you found a candidate well, background checks and reference checks for me are two different things. So, um, in the reference check, um, who they give you as a reference or a list of references mm -hmm. is a good indicator. If they're people who've worked closely with them and recently with them, those are some of the strongest references. And if they can give people they've reported to and people who've reported to them or major donors or something, I think those are great. If the references are a little further removed, meaning they're 10 years old, well, that might say something to me about how they're perceived in their current organization. Um, you're going to do, and we'll talk about social media before we're done from an organization's perspective, but also from a candidate's perspective. 
Um, but in the references, you want to really have the right questions. So you've got to think about what you're asking, and those questions might be different from the different types of references. Um, but if you get it from either formal reference checking, informal reference checking, people you hang out with or you say, oh, we're about to send an offer to Betty Smith, uh, and someone says, or a group of somebody says, gosh, I worked with her and she was terrible, um, you can slow things down and say we'd like to do some additional references. If an organization has candidates sign a release form to check references, it means you can check references uh, that they haven't given you. You still want to do it confidentially so you don't jeopardize somebody's employment, but that gives you the opportunity to say, okay, they didn't give us anybody from Amnesty International and they were there for four years. Uh, they left there two years ago. I know some folks over there. So if you have a signed release form, if it's somebody you can talk to confidential, confidentially, then I would suggest you pick up the phone mm -hmm. and you call that individual and say, I'm just asking for a confidential conversation. But then you also have to think about how you're going to conduct that call because sometimes Human Resources has told them they can't say anything other than he or she worked here. Other times, you'll hear sort of this long pause when you say the individual's name, and then there's nothing else, so they don't want to give you anything else. Um, and I, I, it's sad to say in the nonprofit sector, I think there's a lot of, I don't want to say anything negative about that individual, even though it might damage your organization, because I don't know where this is all going to go. And so you've got to be really attuned to what you're asking, what you're hearing, and what you're not hearing. But I think if you have any concerns, you slow down the recruitment process. Because at the end of the day, it's so more costly to hire the wrong person who you thought was wonderful quickly than to take an extra few days or an extra week and really do the reference checking. That'll give you comfort. Because if you have to ask them to leave in the first month or three months or six months after your donors, after your team, after your board has gotten excited about them at some level, then it's a reflection on you, it's a reflection on the organization consequences you didn't intend. I'm sorry, I don't want you to take too much time on this because it's really easy to do as context, but um, what is the danger of checking? What's, what's the legal ramification of checking a reference that was signed? A uh, reference that wasn't given to you have uh, signed reference release form. So on the one hand, potentially nothing. Right? Because if it's truly confidential, if it doesn't go anywhere between you, other than between you and that individual, then there's potentially no liability. Right. And you're certainly not going to say to the candidate, we're not hiring you because of this reference. That said, unless you can ensure complete confidentiality of that conversation, and if whoever you're calling says to the candidate, oh, I heard from this organization that you're interviewing with, um, that candidate could get unnerved, uncomfortable, ask you about it. Rarely, however, unless you've cost them their job or something else, is it going to go to a lawsuit, if you will. Um, and can that be civil, though? There's, there's no criminal. Depends. Did they lose their job as a result of your phone call? Did you damage them in some other way in a marketplace? Um, again, it happens so rarely, yeah. in part because candidates who are known to be involved in a lawsuit might be a little harder to find a job somewhere else particularly because we can find so much on the internet. So if I'm a candidate, I'm suing your organization that's on a docket somewhere that's now posted electronically, a future employer can find it. Um, but this kind of, your question is a good one, particularly when you're recruiting really senior talent. So you're recruiting a new CEO, and there's really only six people in the world that you want as your CEO. And he or she is gainfully employed somewhere else and highly visible. Well, if you do anything that jeopardizes that position, and costs them that position, or costs them the goodwill, the trust between them and their board when the board finds out that they're looking, even if you approach them, yeah. you've got to be very careful about that. Just to figure out on all um, legal I've read a few articles which um, said that most people now are going to be very careful in finding people um, that would uh, kind of they don't want to take the risk of somebody um, that will file a lawsuit against the organization or the firm they come later on in the future or somebody that can get over war or something. So that legal liability, how much does it play for all in hiring somebody? If you have like two candidates and you know somebody's more of kind of the person that would be likely in the future 
to file a lawsuit against this organization or damage it or they are. Does that affect? It's a good question. Um, in some ways, you should never get to your two semifinalists where you have any significant questions around either of the candidates. That happens, but in an ideal world, you've got two candidates you really can't decide between. And um, you're equally excited about hiring both of them, and that if your first choice doesn't accept, you're ready to go to your second choice. That's the ideal. Um, you can get at some of that by what organizations are doing today, which is increasing the number of interviews they have before they get to the final round. So that could be that Human Resources takes the first round with six, eight, or 12 candidates, and then only moves six or four of them forward to the hiring manager. The hiring manager then interviews two, four, six. And at that point, HR, or the CEO and the hiring manager, spend a lot of time talking about the candidate. And those interviews need to be not just around the technical, but around who they are as a person and their cultural fit within the organization. And you have to have multiple people interviewing for that, for character, if you will. But what groups are doing today is going to a third interview, sometimes a fourth and a fifth, um, particularly if they're larger organizations and they're going to have responsibility uh, in working with multiple teams, whether that's across the globe, whether that's uh, in multiple offices in one country, or whether that's just a big team in one uh, city. So um, organizations are avoiding some of what you're wondering about by having more or interview rounds prior to the final interview. And so, again, you've got to educate everybody who's going to be a part of that process about what they're looking for. Um, but you can take a lot of that away by conducting the right first, second, and third round of interview. If you get there and you really feel that, then you want to stop and figure out how you got there and what you're going to do to manage the situation if you're not going to hire that individual. What's the message you're going to deliver back to them? and how positively you're going to close out that interaction. So how do you handle like raw talents? You know, not necessarily the refined one has all the set skills and you know the risk people. It's not an easy answer for most organizations. Most organizations say, here's who we are as an organization, here's our culture, here's what type of talent fits here. And some of that quite frankly eliminates raw talent. Um, I would say that if you're not willing to look at raw talent at some level, if not at any level, you're quite frankly missing a lot of talent. But then again, you've got to build a process that says, how do we identify raw talent? How do we recruit raw talent? How do we get our team comfortable with raw talent? And then if we hire them, how do we help them be successful in our organization? Because if you're attracted to them because they're raw talent, they bring great stuff to the table but then you don't help them be successful once they're in the organization, it's not going to work. And some of that is, is that raw talent willing to change and grow into once they're internally to be a successful part of the team? I think, again, if you build the right recruitment process and the right orientation process once they're hired, that can be very successful. I think raw talent is huge in startup organizations. Um, that's where you see it most. You see it in fast-growing large organizations. We're going into a particular country we've never been in, or we're launching in our country where we don't have maybe a more formal or a more clearly defined set of roles that we're filling. So how do we figure out how we evaluate, how do we identify, how do we evaluate raw talent, and then how do we make them successful? Um, and you look at a lot of organizations who start up and that talent looks pretty interesting. Those dynamics at that table are pretty interesting early on, but it's sort of the sense of passion and it's the sense of respect that they have for each other that really gets them from where they are at the start to the next level. And when that happens successfully, I think there's a greater acceptance of raw talent because they can say, I was pretty raw when we started this. I was pretty raw when I got here. But look at where we are. Look at how I've grown. I'm excited about doing that again with somebody else. Um, but you have to have a culture that's open to that. Um, again, I think you get better talent when you're open to that, but there's a lot of organizations would say, he or she just isn't going to be a fit here, or we don't have the time to help her or him be a fit here. How do you make sure that you have a, a diverse uh, group of candidates in the beginning? And because, for example, this is something that I've been told by my colleagues, is like, you need to take longer time to apply. Because they need to reflect more, um, and they need to be 
task. That's for that's for trainings, uh, uh, but for industry training, so that might not apply for um, for for bringing into a job, but still look like a reality that depends on depends on um, different positions within the site. So how do you make sure because once you already did the programming it's done. That was really good. Um, well you can do it again but it's a lot of work. So how do you how you make sure from the beginning you are gonna get that that diverse I think it starts with the CEO with the board of directors and that an organization has a commitment to diversity and inclusion. And unless that starts at the top and is th exists throughout the organization, you can quite frankly have the most diverse candidate pool. They're not going to want to come to work with you if you are not at the core a truly diverse and inclusive organization. So you've got to walk the talk before you even start recruiting. Yeah, but I'm just assuming that this has happened. Right. So if it's happened, and I would say today that's still a small percentage of organizations compared to the whole. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, but assuming that that's in place, then you've got to look at how and where you post the job, how long you leave the posting out there, and how you run your recruitment process. So I think if you're truly a diverse and inclusive organization, your staff then become some of your best recruitment agents. So yes, you still have to post on certain job boards and in certain places, but quite frankly, if you created the right workforce, they're going to want to go out and tell the story of why their friends, their colleagues, people they've worked with elsewhere want to come to work here because we're really committed to what we say we do. That's going to be the strongest way to recruit talent. Um, it also means that your talent, your staff, who are already very busy, should be involved in other organizations on committees and on boards because quite frankly, again, they get to know talent in a different way. I've loved serving on a committee with him. He's great. Now that we've got a spot that he's doing somewhere else, it'd be great if we could recruit him to work with us. Again, it shortens recruitment time, but it again gets you to people who really want to be working in your organization. <coughs> again, you can then look at, <clears throat> all right, we don't have any connections to a diverse pool of talent at the moment. How do we create that? Where do we post the job? Is that the National Society of Hispanic MBAs? Is that uh, other organizations? I mean, you look at where you want to post that, um, where there's a pool of talent that reflects what you want to build, in your organization or what you've already built. Um, and it also means monitoring the applications that are coming in and the people that you're interviewing. So if the t responses you're getting aren't very diverse, then at a week, at two weeks, at three weeks, what are we doing or what are we doing that we thought would work that isn't and how do we adjust to make sure we ultimately get a diverse pool. But that adds a lot of work to the recruitment process that not all HR departments have time uh, for. Again, if it's a truly inclusive organization and that is part of everything you do, then it'll be there. If we're trying to build it out for the first time, then we've got to spend some more time watching what's coming in, watching how we create our materials. Um, <clears throat> one of the things on one of my slides talks about when you create an ad, when you create a position profile, but particularly when you create an ad, don't tell people who are going to read the ad what the job is. Tell them what you're really looking for. So yes, that gets to skills, but tell your organization's story. So if you have a commitment to diversity and inclusion, make sure that that posting really underscores your commitment. Uh, otherwise, somebody who's attuned to that would say, well, they don't say anything about it. I've been on their website. They don't say anything about it. Um, I've looked at their workforce. It's not very diverse. I may not apply there. So you've really got to take a step back and look at it from every perspective. So you, you, so you recommend um, to include in the job description or in the way you ask? In the way you describe the organization. We are a culturally diverse organization. We are a global organization working in multiple communities. There's a number of ways you're going to say it to properly describe your organization. But if you just say that it's Solutions is a boutique search firm in Washington, D.C., well, it's a great description of our company, but it doesn't at all help you understand our culture and what we value in terms of the people on our team. So describing your organization in a way that truly reflects who you are and who your people are and how much you value them it doesn't have to take a lot of space in that ad, but I do say that if you get that right, you get a better pool of candidates. 
Um, in a situation where a candidate applies after the deadline, it's one of two reasons. And if it's a profile of one of you have a lack of research or you just like this one. I would say a lot of organizations say, our deadline is our deadline. They didn't apply, sorry. From my perspective, and what we do here and what we advocate our clients to is, it doesn't matter what the deadline is. If you have not extended an offer and the right talent comes through the door, comes through the email, comes through whatever, you should take a look at Hammerhair. You should interview them because, quite frankly, it's in your best interest as an organization to recruit the best talent possible. And so if your deadline was November 15th and today is November 22nd, and you go, wow, what a phenomenal candidate, we've got to talk to him or her, then take the time and find a way to get them into the process and do it. And for some organizations, yes, for some, no. I, again, would argue for um, flexibility. You can ask that, but they may just not have seen it. So, you know, we say this to, um, Folks, all the time. We started a recruitment effort on a certain timeline. You may not have started your job search until three quarters of the way through my recruitment activity because you weren't looking for a job prior to that. So now that you're suddenly attuned to finding a new opportunity for yourself, well, that had no bearing on my timeline, my recruitment timeline. So again, I don't think it makes a difference. Um, now, if it's somebody who at the start of your recruitment sent an email and said, hey, can I have a position profile, or I see you're looking for this position. And then two months later came back, I might ask the question, what took you two months to apply? But if it's just someone's come into the market um, and it's after the deadline, I'm, again, I'm personally more concerned about getting the right talent, not about it wasn't on the deadline. I'm just wondering, you know, uh, some of position plans take like equal opportunity, you know, they, they don't discriminate with the, the person is disabled, with disability, and the rest of it. But you still see that disabled people are seen as a liability. Most of the position must see that, but the real says they still don't recruit them. So, what's your take? I would say when a lot of organizations, but not all, think about a diverse workforce, they don't necessarily think about those who have some level of disability. Um, they may not have an organization that's equipped to provide a conducive workplace, and yet, of course, they should. Um, but that's a little more difficult. You know, if somebody's blind and we don't have keyboards in our organization, and more importantly, or maybe not more importantly, but as um, IT doesn't have experience in that, and we have to think about how to differently provide internal service to help them be successful. Um, you know, a lot of that has an impact on the recruitment. Yet again, at the same time, when an organization has consciously thought through that, has built out an office system that is truly inclusive, um, then they are welcoming to candidates. Um, but not all organizations are set up. Some of the smaller organizations in particular are not. Um, but I think it's an area where there's still a lot of work to be done. I <laughs> will please speak up for the people.
So the second half of that was an easier question. <laughs> I think that's where you've got to spend a lot of time getting to know the individuals, and particularly if you're recruiting an entire team or an entire organization of tutors. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how much can you get to know about them before you decide to bring them on? And as you get to know them, what do you say is, here's where they line up with who we are and what our values are. Here's where we know they don't. And of the areas where we know they don't line up with who we are culturally, what can we live with and what can't we live with? And if there's too much of the, we're going to lose our identity because they're in such a different place on these issues or these values, then maybe you don't bring them on. Now that is hard if you've got a donor that says, we really want you to take these folks on, they're great. So if you have to do that, if you ultimately <clears throat> choose to do that, what do you do as you bring them on? And what do you do on a consistent basis to help them understand your organization and your culture? And then what do you do with yourself and with your team to say, okay, look, we brought this group of people and they are different from who we are. They can still help us achieve our mission, but we've got to put all of this in perspective for the good of what we want to achieve. And that means a lot of messaging, that means a lot of ongoing education, and that means a lot of team building to ultimately get everybody comfortable with the fact that we're two very different teams, or now five very different teams, and yet we're all working towards the same goal. And so again, if everybody really is working towards the same goal, there's a great opportunity or a great lesson here, a great opportunity for education around we're all working for the same goal, we're all doing it differently, we're slightly different people, um, but we can all do this together. But you've got to work at it constantly. Where you bring in one or two or three different types of people, different cultures of people, and you don't spend time on ensuring that we all work together, it will be a disaster. And that's what you see when you see things fall apart. They say, okay, we wanted to take this team, or we had to take this team, and that's actually the worst way to start. We had to take this team. We willingly and excitingly took this team. We knew they were a little different than our culture. And what are we going to do to ensure that we all work well together? And you've got to spend a lot of time on that for that to be successful. Or you will have the dire consequences you didn't want that you talked about. I'm spending a lot of time talking about, now that you're here, part of our organization, here's who we are. We want to find a way to work together for the good of the cause, for the good of the organization. Thanks, Jim. Uh, my question is mostly uh, a follow-up to Ahmed's question, but it's more the character piece. Uh, back in my country, Nigeria, there was a certain NGO. They had international donor funding. It was meant to be like in two cycles, so they had funding for the first cycle, but it was misappropriated, and the donors decided not to continue for the second cycle. Most of the uh, it's members of the team, particularly the senior leadership team, country director, and coach, had challenges afterwards. They were kind of blacklisted. It wasn't said openly, but what I heard from several colleagues was 
whenever they see applications from any of those folks in that organization. So, now, so the question is, this like is a character issue now. From well, your experience, what would be the approach? You give the response, be part of the response in the next question. Take take each individual separately. But from the individuals involved, now what can they do? Because they can't really advocate for themselves. The whole organization is blacklisted. They need jobs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anytime people see they care from social so organization, they don't move forward with the process. Sadly, it's a very real reality today in a lot of places around the globe. And it's unfair. Um, and in some ways, there's no way around it. But let's look at it from a different perspective. So what's the sort of concern and challenge? All right, here she is from this particular organization, which we know wasn't managed well or was truly mismanaged. Um, what are we looking to hire them for? If it's a um, more junior position in the organization, I think it is a little easier to deal with that issue. If it's somebody who's going to head donor activities, if it's somebody who's going to head uh, the financial management, if it's going to be somebody who's going to head communications, and if it's going to be somebody who's going to be the CEO, I think that's very difficult. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but then what you've got to think about is, okay, we've decided we're going to interview him even though he worked at this organization. What do we want to know to figure out whether or not he's a fit for the job we're hiring for? But then, what do we want to get at in terms of was he really a part of that mismanagement? And then, even if we're comfortable that he wasn't, what do we have to do to our external constituencies so to help them understand that we made a good hire? Because quite frankly, when the press release comes out and says, we've hired a chief development officer from such and such an organization, and the public and your donors say, how can they hire that crook, right? I mean, you've got to work on messaging. So maybe it's, and again, whether that's your chief financial officer on that staff, whether it's development, whether it's communications with the CEO, it might be that you go to your board, or you go to your donors, or you go to your other key stakeholders before you announce that hire, and you say, here's who we're hiring, here's how we got comfortable with this, what questions can we answer for Sometimes it might be including some of them in the actual interview process. That's a little harder um, because you're then allowing somebody into your recruitment process who normally wouldn't be. But if ultimately it's the right person and you really want them and you know that you've got to manage something externally, you shouldn't have to. You look at how you recruit differently and who you involve. Do very much then look at how you message that higher publicly. So invariably the individuals can't do anything for themselves. It's hard. Now, that said, uh, again, if um, there's a group of people who weren't directly involved, um, is there a way to educate other human resources executives um, that this talent is out there, that they are really good, talented people? There might be, um, but that might be city-specific, that might be country-specific, that might be sector-specific. Um, <clears throat> Even in a situation like that, there are probably some good senior leaders who, yeah, we might not hire him because we can't afford to take that hit publicly. But I know him, he's my friend, he's my neighbor, he's been someone I've been close to for a long period of time. If he's come to me and said, I had this great team and they really weren't involved in any way, shape, or form, is there anything you can do in terms of helping them or hiring them? I do think there's ways that are informal like that that can help others. And I guess if I were in that situation, I'd want to do that for my team if, in fact, we were all caught up in something that might damage all of us professionally where we had no responsibility to help those individuals. And I do think if you've got a strong network, uh, if you've got a relationship of trust with a lot of people in the sector outside of the organization, you can actually help change some of that. And you can help those individuals land. Certainly harder. Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. I don't think that's the same. I remember some time, we asked you the last two years, they actually did it. We took all the equipment. I was working in the future. So, you know what I think when the principal recipient of the NHC are married, is doing something that probably 
they think it is not compatible, but uh, with the values and stuff, they normally go like the organization like uh, uh, the Federation of uh, Red Cross and all those other people. So there's a high team of organizations that you can't because of their strange relationship with you. So, yeah. so what normally happens is like if it's like food security, livelihood, uh, emergencies and stuff, in a new organization that can't just take over people. Like but what normally happens is they have a strategy of using those people. You just take them on board with the contract. But the contract's normally like that's six months is one year. So you don't renew the contract. You take it to go and run the price of your culture and the system. So that's how they normally do it. So it's probably an easy process. You can't just like track them up. You just wait up the track them up. So you can just take the contract. You take it away. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition, okay. so in addition to what um, colleague said, you know, there are situations where I've met um, people who have had bad experience with organizations. I want to apply for other jobs, they, they exclude that they experience of the person. I mean, is that lying? That's a tough question. Um, so let's talk about resumes for a moment. Um, I personally believe we should include everything on our resumes, including dates. So if you graduated from school in 1964, or 1974, or 1984, or 1994, I think that should be on your resume because you want people to know as much about you as possible. Now that's me, and that's sometimes a naive approach, but I'd rather be honest about who you are and what your experience was. It allows me to have a greater connection more quickly with you if I understand your experience, and I can get a lot of that sort of fact-checking stuff out of the way much more quickly to get to the real conversation. Um, on the other hand, there are people who have five years of experience or 40 years of experience. They only want to put a certain amount of it on their resume. So to your question, I guess it depends on where it was in their career. So if I've got 20 or 30 years of experience, and the organization I leave off my resume was 10 or 15 years ago, so all I've put is 10 years of experience on, well, you've left 10 years off. Maybe you've got an addendum, maybe that's not on there. Maybe you've got a wording that says in previous 10 years of experience in a different sector. I don't think it's necessarily bad in that respect. On the other hand, if you were at an organization until October of 2006, and then from November of 2006 to May of 2007, you were somewhere, and you just sort of switched the resume to say, this job ended in 2006, and then the one that started in June of 2007, you just said 2007, I think you are being a little dishonest. Um, and quite frankly, with sort of the footprint, um, there may have been a press release. There may have been a directory on the website that said Betty Smith Extension 12. Now we know that you're there. There may have been um, a, a, a research paper that was published with your name on it at that organization, or you were the point of contact for a conference. So now when I look for you and your background on the internet, which happens in a lot of searches long before you're even called in for an interview, and I see somehow that you're at an organization that's not on your resume, I might say, what else did she live off her resume? I'm not willing to take the time and energy, no matter how great that resume looked. Um, sometimes I might. I might say, you know what, there might be a reason for this, but I think more often than not, we're sort of prone to say we have 100 resumes. i got to get to the best five of these. I found something wrong. There could be something else missing here. I don't want to take the time because I can't advance that to somebody else in our organization. At the end of the day, if you had a bad experience somewhere, I do think it can be explained away. Uh, I do think you want to own it because the more honest you are, quite frankly, the organization is going to see that. And ultimately, I believe if you have all the right experience or a lot of the right experience, and there's one little blip on your resume, but you, it's there, it means we can have a conversation about it. And then you can put that in context for me. And today, it could be anything from the organization lost its funding and went out of business, the organization merged with another, or, oh, I've just recruited six people from that organization. Nobody's happy over there. I'm going to ask her the question, but I don't really care that she was there for six months because I, I've got a context for recruiting others there.
long-winded answer. Sorry. I mean, as you were asking your question, the Academy of Educational Development, I mean, so that was a big one that sort of fell apart, right? So there are a lot of great people who are there who, who had no responsibility in what happened. Again, I think in that organization in particular, it, people are comfortable enough saying he or she looks to be far enough away from what we perceive the problem was. We're not going to hold that against him or her. But I can say that I'm sure there are organizations where it's somebody who's on the senior staff team who's applied for a job in that organization. And they might say, not even going to go there. Our donors would never understand this. Or if we're going to bring her in, we really have to get comfortable about how she, close she was to this. And then we've got to be able to message that. But I think it's manageable. Yeah. So the country wants to buy something. One of the jobs that I have is in the US Army. I'm from Austin. I'm from the United States. And I know it's not the same job. If I would just get it, I would not get it. That country has to come. So I don't think how more I would do that. I don't know. I'm, I was not hiding something bad. <laughs> so, I don't have an answer for that, but so some of the questions would be. This is good. We appreciate this. Can you move the camera on him? But think about it. So, you applied for a job that hired you. Now, to get a visa, there might be a much more extensive process. And then it's. Right, but the flip side of that is, what if they had done more extensive checking after hiring you, and it was found out that you were in the U.S. Army, and as a result, you weren't able to go to country to do that assessment? And everybody's got to do what's right for them, but I don't have an answer on that one. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I, it's it's two parts. One is that when we're on, on the topic of resumes, uh, so I, I personally am someone who I, I don't stick around for long if I think it's not going anywhere. So there have been points in time where I've been with an organization for six months, like the one that I left right now to, to become a fellow here. It was like four or five months, and it's okay for me to put that on my resume simply because I've transitioned on to something which I had no control over. But uh, is there like a number or a time period which we should count when we're looking at candidates in terms of? organizations to give coating on their resume. So if I've been with an organization for three months and then I quit because I just saw it not working out, does it make any sense retrospectively to continue to have that on my resume or to even check that on a potential employee's resume or teammate's resume for the rest of their careers? Again, I sort of argue for a, a full resume. Right. Include all your experience on there. And if you've changed jobs every three months, six months, nine months, there are going to be some people who aren't going to look at you. And you need to know that, because what's the alternative? OK, she worked till this point. She didn't work for these six months, but you really did. I'd say just be honest and own it. There are some organizations that still aren't going to care. Um, they're going to say, look, we're in the startup phase. She's worked with some great organizations. Let's bring her in and ask her questions about why she didn't stay and see whether we like the answers. But the places you've worked might actually help you get into your next employer, as much as that might keep you out of, the, out of a, a prospective employer. Um, again, startups, experience like that is a lot easier. More established organizations might not. On the other hand, they might say, look, this is typically a three to six month field position. Our preference is to then hire them if it's gone well and bring them into the organization more formally. But you know what? If she's got a three to six month track record, then perhaps we'll give her a shot I'll see if that works out. Here in the States, you see that a lot in um, organizations, uh, particularly for-profit companies that do a lot with candidates' campaigns. I mean, people are on a campaign for three months, six months, whatever. And in that sector, it doesn't hold them back at all because it's just the nature of the work. I do think at some level in the nonprofit sector, particularly as it relates to those in the field, 
there is an understanding that those positions can be a little shorter mm -hmm. um, for any number of reasons from didn't like the conditions of the organization of the country of the work to the organization lost its funding midway through that project. So I think again, just own it, put it on there. Um, if somebody doesn't want to hire you for that, do you really want to work there? But That's sort of I, my philosophy. Sir, this, oh my god. Okay, I think go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind watching whose hands goes up first so that I don't start uh, missing folks. Yeah, I, I think Mikang and Tolita have been on. But Jesper, since you haven't asked a question at all, you want to you go, <laughs> and then we'll go back to people who had a chance. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if you can speak uh, a little bit about the uh, social media aspect of um, hiring people. Um, for example, how uh, leaders should react if a uh, person is not uh, that, uh, for example, have a lot of pictures, print <laughs> 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 uh, and are very active on Twitter, for example. Um, how should a leader react to that kind of thing? So, social media is certainly having an impact on the recruitment process. And it actually works both ways. How does an organization perceive a candidate? How does a candidate see, perceive an organization? Um, and some of what I'm about to say may seem old school. I think if you're looking for a job and you've got a Facebook page or something else that shows a lot of drinking, Shut it down for the period of while you're looking for a job. Um, that's personal preference. Um, if I saw a great candidate and he or she had lots of pictures about drinking and out every night of the week, would I keep them out of the process? No. Could I technically ask any questions about that activity? No. Um, but are some organizations going to look at that and say, just not the type of person we want here, even though we know that all of our other employees are doing that? Um, it's sort of how is he presenting? Himself. I think it becomes critical the more senior the role is. So again, if it's our chief development officer, our chief financial officer, our chief communications officer, something who's going to be an external representative for us, um, organizations are probably going to pay particular attention to that because when the announcement goes out, donors, other stakeholders are going to look, they're going to Google, they're going to see this, and then they're going to say, the organization I give all this money to actually hired him or her to do that. So I think being prudent during the job search. On the other hand, if it's really who you are, if it's what you want out there, then leave it out there and know that for some organizations um, it'll have consequences. At the same time, if you're a candidate and you're looking at organizations, do your homework. So don't just look at their website, but what are former employees saying about them online? Um, what are they saying on issues that are important to you? So if the organization takes a position on 12 very different issues and you're looking at working in one program area, um, are you, even though you're not going to work in those other 11 program areas, are you aligned with their thinking? Um, are you aligned with what they're putting out, even if it's an issue you um, feel the same about? So it goes both ways, I'd say. But I think candidates should pay attention to what they're putting out there in any way, shape, or form, and know that it may or may not have consequences. I have some clients who say, okay, on paper, Jim, he looks really great, but his views are so different than ours. And what they do, quite frankly, is they bring the candidate in because they say, our viewpoints are our viewpoints. And we got to them in a certain way. But we don't want to exclude viewpoints that aren't exactly ours, because otherwise we're going to have a pretty sort of bland workplace culture. So if he or she comes with a different mindset and a different position, but it's healthy, respectfully different, and we can all learn from it, then we probably do want him or her in our organization. It just depends on the nature of some of it. Uh, oh. Okay, since you haven't asked a question at all. Uh, of course, thank you. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things I'm not looking for is to think of the dichotomy between international and uh, for instance, in the UNDP project, I was negotiating for consultants <coughs> in my NGO, lots of professional services. I mean, the, the margin was kind of crazy that most of the consultants in my firm that want to use participate in the project, they said, felt that I was insulting them. You know, they have local experience, and even more international experience than the international. 
you know, so do you share the same view that that should be a big part of the privacy control in your region? It's hard to understand why organizations make the decisions that they do. Johan, I would like to add to answer that because I don't even find that the last question is that the reason we need is USAID says actually. So what? USAID says in your job, job, you have to hire a local consultant. You have to hire a local consultant. I'm talking of the remuneration. The remuneration is also stated. And that's what I'm saying. If for me, it doesn't add up. The reason is now, well, local consultants, you have the local experience, you understand the institutions, and perhaps number of years why you are more experienced than international consultants. I don't think that it, it's just not fair. If you take a person and say, I'm ready to pay them, I'm ready to pay them. I think they put it in three times the salary that the salary that the salary that the three countries pay. Because this if we this this in a massive way, like for example when there's the this uh uh the prices to in like the prices so no more profit of the kind of a whole certain thing so housing becomes more expensive, food becomes more expensive, uh everything becomes more expensive. That's not no actually the reason no be that many those consultants in the mind when they go abroad, also are treated as an international consultant. I'm saying that we should be wiped out. Yeah. 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 What I wanted to say is the reason is simple. When you are not in your country, you are not in another country, you are not in your own village tradition, you are not in your comfort zone, you are sleeping in a hotel, you are also sleeping in your bed, you are watching your dog, you are watching your So all those things will have to see that. No, 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 it's not just as easy as <laughs> It has nothing to do with other things that you're probably thinking. That's why if you go to another country, you get those benefits that suit you in the expansion. It really doesn't have to do with any other factors of the spinning and human stuff. It's just you being taken away from the company so into another place. That's the only reason, nothing else. So you think that's fair? I, I think it's fair. I because think it's fair. I think it's fair. Uh, I think it's fair. Uh, from what I Okay, now it's going alphabetically. So it's J L. <laughs> <laughs> Joey, <Joita>, and Louise, <laughs> Mika. Thank you. <laughs> From what I've seen throughout the morning, I've heard there seems to be no set criteria really. It's like more of a to me to his own concept. So if you could just uh, lay down some golden rules or do's and don'ts. It's almost like we're consulting you. It's <laughs> fine. I think when you're an organization thinking about hiring, you need to start with, do we have a solid understanding of who our existing team is, who our hiring exec is? Are we clearly defining the role, not just for the person who just left it, what was the role, but are we clearly defining the role for going forward? So that means if it's an existing role, let's take a step back. Let's think about what we want and what we need now. I think spending time on that up front is critically important. And as a part of that, deciding what type of experience do we want. And that's sort of then what you'll probably take out to the world, if you will. Who are we? What do we want? What do we need? And how are we going to tell that story? So not just we're hiring a director of development or a field director and we need 10 years of experience in this, but who are we? Why do you want to come to work for our organization? You've got to tell that story that's your employer brand. And spending the time to get that right in position description, uh, on your website, how you define your organization, in any ads you place, and in any conversations you have with prospective candidates, that's critically clear. Yet at the same time, you have to have a solid understanding of who fits into the culture of your organization. So what are the skills that, uh, the personal traits, behavioral traits that you want as you interview candidates? And how do you decide what the right mix is? Because some organizations will say, she's got three out of five of the experience sets we want. We really want those other two. Oh my gosh, she's got the most incredible personality. She's the strongest cultural fit of all the candidates we've interviewed. So what's the trade-off? How do we decide? hire the person who's the better cultural fit, perhaps a little less experience, 
and the perfect who's the person who's the better experiential fit, but maybe isn't a strong fit with culture, and having a formal recruitment <coughs> process down to not only how are we going to tell our story, but where are we going to tell our story, and are we going to empower our existing team to tell our story, and are we going to uh, not only empower them, but encourage them to help us find employees, even though it's not their job. Because if we're looking for somebody in your team, and he's not at all involved in your team, you two don't work at all together, but his personal or his social network has the right people in it, then how do we empower and encourage him to tell the story of why somebody he knows wants to come work in your team? That's where you get the best recruitment. You still always have to put the ads out there. You still have to always have it visible on your website. But the more you can use your existing team to tell your story, particularly around the talent you're looking for, the more successful you're going to be. I think the more transparent you are, the better. If you're an organization that works people hard, long hours, and you're going to get rid of them every six months because that's just the way you run, then be honest about that because there will be people who will be attracted to that. Versus if you're an organization that has a particular culture and we want you to fit that, um, or we have a particular type of work we're trying to do now, tell that story. The more transparent you are, the better pool of candidates you get, the better interviews you have with candidates, and the easier it will then be to bring on board your candidate of choice because he or she won't say, you didn't tell me that. He or she can say the hiring manager had his or her you know, best game on for when they interviewed me, and now they're totally different when I come into the organization. But it's then also turning around and saying, okay, we've just hired him or her. How do we make them successful? It's not just here's your job, great, now go run with it. But how do we make you successful in the first week, the first month, the first year, and beyond? And then how are we going to grow you inside the organization? So again, having plans for all of this, rather than just saying, okay, let's fill this and we'll figure it out later. But how do we grow you? Because if we really like you and what you bring to the table, we're going to lose you at some point if we don't have a career path for you inside of our organization. And yet sometimes by the size of your organization or the nature of your work or how it's funded, you're going to lose great people. So when you lose great people, how do you lose them gracefully so that they become your ambassadors out there for recruiting future talent? The best source of recruiting talent are the people who work for you and those who have worked for you and had a positive experience. And that means how you let them go when you have to let them go. Um, because some of them will want to come back. Some of them will say, oh, you're applying there? I worked there five years ago. It was the most incredible experience of my life. Or it was just a good experience, but I'm where I am today because I had that experience. So having all of this as clearly defined as possible from before you even begin the recruitment process allows you to be that much more successful in finding the right talent to apply, recruiting the right person, bringing them on board, and then keeping them with the organization for the right period of time. Please. Um, uh, like a concrete case that I'm having now, I'll say it's if you go to a specific job in the market, I'm not the time I am recruiting a group of consultants in Colombia, and I found out that today we were there that I just got two, two applications for the job, which is how we sort of, and I sort of have thought at the beginning that this might happen, but I have to do it in the last time So uh, now I'm um, in the process, like, I think I'm going to start the, the requirements. Um, and I want to put that, uh, that, that request for proposal to the game out again. And so how do you recommend me to do this? So, OK, so I want to I want to a team of consultants. I haven't found a good, a good um, I haven't found like people. Uh, I know that the distribution has been grown widely because we have like a, a network of different organizations with different ways to the country. So I mean, I know that it's, it's been widespread. So what do you recommend me to do? And how do you, um, so how do you recommend, what can you recommend to change? And in the moment of putting out again the, the what do you do to ask me? Because I feel I feel as though that people might be oh it's just like they say I don't like it already. So what for that is it's in those two. I'd probably suggest a couple of things. I think looking at 
um, which consultants have already applied, if you will. And if you've truly decided you're not going to hire them, then tell them that. Yeah. If there's a percentage of that pool that you might keep, say, go, I'd go to them and say, we are reposting this. We are trying to find some additional um, resources. But we haven't taken you off the list the way we have others. Please bear with us, because you may very well come back to one of those firms. You want to be as positive as possible. But then if you're going to repost, don't just repost. Because that may get you the same thing you already have now or nothing. So take a step back and say, what is it that these firms that we're looking at, these consultants that we're looking at, don't have? And who has it? And that may be the harder part, right? So proactively trying to figure out who you'd like to bid on this and how do you do that? It's sort of working the network. Um, if they're more visible consultants, and they're not always, um, how do you find them online, and then how do you go directly to them with the proposal, or the request for proposals? Um, who do you know in the country that can say, here's the consultants that you'd really like to be talking to, not the consultant, but here's the top tier of consultants in this space that you would want to be associated with. It's going to take you some time, but that will increase the response. But then I also think about this for the future. So right now, and when you're done and you hire a consultant, what did you learn from this experience that you can do differently in this country? The country claim the next time you need a consultant. Uh, or apply that to other countries that you're going to be doing the same sort of consultant recruitment and what can we do differently at the start so that we don't run into this again. It's not easy, it's a little painful, um, but again, I think managing it with as much appropriate communication as possible strengthens you and your organization for this particular project and with um, these consultants for the future. So you are going to interview me, like you are going to talk with all of them that they, so you are going to talk with the people that, with those consultants that I know that are good that they can apply? Yes. Um, assuming that's acceptable within your organization's guidelines, but I would say if it is, absolutely. And if it's because she is one person company or team, he's a one person company or team, but they bring different skill sets, it might be that you talk to each of them individually, then you go back to them as a group and say, um, each of you individually doesn't bring all that we need for this project, but bringing you all together will allow us as an organization to be successful. Would you be willing to work together and how do we do that so that your uh, all your your needs as consultants, your business needs are met appropriately? If you get the work, we get the solution we need. Do you have some thoughts, Ryan? Yes. Oh, I was going to say that another thing that you should probably is the cost of value. Because the cost of the cost of value is really the cost of value. You don't want to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's just something in some ways. And we're looking at it say that we have another speaker somewhere. Uh, you've got another speaker somewhere, don't you? Enjoy it. Everyone's lovely. So if you have another 20 minutes, these questions are far more important than that because they can take it away and ask questions. So you have another 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, that's actually the idea. This is a good idea. So when you do that, you have to know what does it mean? What does it mean? Because they've got some better than what we can do and share with each other. Yeah, and then you see everyone. Oh, I mean, just okay. Okay, that's right. 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 Okay, that's right.
he started as an intern and he's now in director at the IDF interviewing for 10, 20 years. But back then, that would never happen. You know? So what, what's your take on that? I think um, every organization looks at that differently. So again, the startup organization might not care whether you're there 18 months, three years, or five years. Um, I also think if you're somewhere 10, 15, or 20 years, it depends on what that looks like. So were you in three or five different roles in that time period? Well, that's very different than having the same job for 15 or 20 years. Because one could argue, may or may not be right, that if you're in the same job for 15 years, you're a little stale. Whereas if you're at the same organization for 15 years, but had three very different jobs, or three progressions within the same department, then um, you've actually learned a lot. You've grown, and you've had very different experience. So I think every organization is going to look at a resume differently. I think to the extent that you can be there three years or five years, um, <clears throat> that just sets you apart from a whole bunch of other folks who are there 18 months to 20 months to maybe two years, and that stability does go a long way. But I wouldn't stay in a position if it wasn't truly really challenging. So at the point that the role is no longer challenging for you, then start to look for the right next opportunity. And <clears throat> I would say the earlier you are in your career, the more flexibility you have. I mean, when I started in my first five years, I had three different jobs. In my first 10 years, I had five different jobs. And so when I landed at the company before this, the advice everybody gave to me was, you darn well better be in the job for five years because nobody's going to hire you after that. Because you've hit a certain age, you've had too many jobs, and you don't look stable. Um, I ended up staying in the job for 10 years because I loved it. Um, but I think you've just got to manage it appropriately. You've got to be able to tell the story of why you made the transitions you did. But I think three to five years in each job, if it's truly challenging for you, does set you apart in the sector. <laughs> so the role of social media, um, I think it's still developing. I think that using social media to recruit uh, is helpful. I don't think it's completely defined yet. And what works for one organization may not for another. So right now, when we talk about social media, for us, in terms of recruiting talent, it's more LinkedIn than anything else. Um, some nonprofits use Craigslist and have great response. Others don't or use it and have a horrible response. Some <clears throat> are more sophisticated and say, you know what? The type of people we want are in certain groups on Facebook. And so the only place we're going to post our ads are in certain groups on Facebook. Um, so it works differently for every group. I don't know that anybody is having true great success that you can look at metrics on yet. I think 18 months to three years from now, there'll be some organizations that do. And those are probably the ones that you're going to want to look at um, most directly. I mean, perhaps here at Pew Charitable Trusts might be one of the folks who does that well. Um, but I think we've got a long way to go because people still don't understand the tools and how to use them in recruitment. And quite frankly, not all candidates are on the same type of tools. So what I might use from a social media perspective to tell the story of a search I'm doing for a director of communications, well, where I find candidates might be a very different tool than when I'm telling the story about a director of finance search. But unless somebody has the time to sit back and think about how to structure each one of those social media um, outreach efforts for a search and how that might be different, I think people are going to default to the one or two, three that they know well and hope that that works. I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. Uh, I do think that some of the staffing agencies are getting to a point where they use social media extensively. Um, and one of the things that helps them is that they're telling a story about the organization and the role they're recruiting for. They're, just, they're not just um, saying, here's the job, here's what their responsibilities are. I have a long way to go. Oh, so I have a small question, and then perhaps if we let you, know, you get to your active presentation, <laughs> sort of I the presentation. Okay. Um, I was just saying, in terms of posting on social media or otherwise, there are some openings where you, you ask somebody to send in their CV and a cover letter. Or you have some sort of a breakdown of a CV on your own website and people keep filling details. What do you think is more useful? Because traditionally, a resume is supposed to be 
one page, but that really doesn't say a lot about anyone's background, especially as you go along in your career. So if I think we're still in flux, so I think the traditional resume is still what most organizations look for and understand how to use. Mm -hmm. But I think more candidates have, um, more people have their own Facebook, I'm sorry, their own website. Not specific to a search mm -hmm. or job search, but specific to telling the story of who they are. And it's a catch-all. It tells about the job they have, it tells about the consulting they do, it tells about their personal life. And sometimes in a job search, that website gets transformed to be sort of a virtual resume. Um, not all organizations are quite comfortable with what to do with an online resume yet. Larger companies, more sophisticated companies might be. Those in the social media space mm -hmm. might be. But we're also now seeing things like virtualcv.com. And it's where an organization like mine can build out an entire slate of candidates for a client and electronically the client can go in and see the same thing about candidates um, from pictures to links to their blogs and their websites and the work that they do, etc. That's still an early tool that hasn't been adopted yet um, or as widely yet, but I again say in three years or five years, tools like that are going to very much be a part of the hiring process. Um, so there's some work happening there, not as much as we'll see in terms of formal part of the process as we will see in three years or five years. I think at the end of the day, do what's most comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. If you're gainfully employed somewhere and you have a resume website and your employer finds that when they Google you for whatever reason or a donor of yours finds that you're looking for a job and says, why is our development director looking for Why does she have a website up? You know, you've got to sort of take all that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a website that somehow is sort of protected until you're ready to share it with an employer. Um, a lot of that we're still figuring out. Um, I think everyone's done with questions. So we have another maybe 10 minutes at best. So is there any particular <laughs> tools or anything I think we specific? To a lot. I mean, it talks <laughs> a lot about how to recruit talent. Um, and it talks about sort of the maybe best practices question I answered in terms of how do you design the role that you're looking for? How do you tell the story of what you're looking for? How do you design a recruitment process that attracts the talent that you want? How do you evaluate them and then how do you bring them on board? So that's a lot of the slides that you'll see that we posted just yesterday. Um, but it goes more to that. I, I do think we got to a good bit of it with the questions. Well, on behalf of Atlas Core and the Atlas Core fellows who are here today, thank you so much for the Absolutely. presentation. It was really wonderful. Um, I think we all learned a lot. Um, I think what was most interesting to me was some of the sort of pick up some loopholes that can happen. You can get in trouble when you're applying for jobs, something <laughs> that I do frequently. Um, and um, now we have a, a little special gift and sort of formal thing. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, on behalf of the fellows and staff, we'd like to thank you for your Atlas for insurance. Thank you. And our Atlas for still pinned, so we're going to get pinned. Now we're going to take jacket back on for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A tie pin. I like that. We're going to bring tie pins back in. <laughs> Left or right, whichever you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> now they tell. Let me say when I scream when it hits me. Ah, <laughs> the, the blood, you know, it's not pretty. Uh, that's a nice pen. Is that it? That's a good one. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And that's been emailed to everyone for. I took your instructions. Thank Just you. Me.
Wow, really? Yes, really. <laughs> oh no! Even the camera doesn't look like. <laughs> Even the camera says this is a terrible idea. I'm sorry. There are like five people online watching. Oh, good. That's not weird at all. No. Wonderful. Well, how did everyone like the morning? Is this okay? Yeah. Is good? We're awake? Mostly? Yeah? yeah. Good. Awesome. Um, so, uh, <coughs> Blackmore, uh, I think you and I should work together. I'm O negative. <laughs> you can be O negative too. We can share our, our cultures. You can join as well. It will be great. You can you can help me. <laughs> you missed it. You missed all this question. I'm AB negative. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now we're prepared for emergencies. Should anyone need a transfusion? We're okay. Yeah. All right. So. So far during training, we've, we've talked about leadership, and we've talked about types of organizations, and we've talked about what color personality we have, and all of these things. Um, and we've also talked about relief pitchers. Who remembers that from the first day? Yeah? Awesome. So I'm, I'm a little bit of a relief pitcher today. Uh, so get excited. Be prepared for this. Um, generally, I really like to have a plan for things. Um, I'm sure that makes me some color personality. Some, yeah. One of those colors, that's me. Um, and so today is going to be a really interesting opportunity for all of us to kind of talk about things from our own perspectives because my plan has changed a little bit um, as a relief pitcher. Um, so, are you using PowerPoint at all? Nope, sure not. It's just me. <laughs> Low tech. <laughs> um, no technology except for all of, all of this and maybe this conference call thing I'm sitting on. Um, <laughs> so, I've had a chance to talk to a few of you over the last few days. Um, but for those of you who I haven't gotten to share some of my personal story with, um, my name is Emily and I'm relatively new to Atlas Core. My background is in volunteer management and com community development, um, but I have mostly worked with uh, something called community needs assessment. Is anyone familiar with this sort of strategy? Good. This is, I think, the most effective way of working in communities. If you're doing something the community doesn't need, it's going to fail, and also it's a waste of your time. So, today we're going to do a little bit of community needs assessment as a group because I don't want to talk about things that you don't care about or don't want because it's a waste of my time and yours. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about how you can assess the communities that you're working in here as fellows, but then also communities that you'll be working with in the future. Um, originally, my topic was sustainable volunteer programming, um, and we're going to change that just a little bit to talking about sustainability in general. So, for me, in my opinion, uh, I think one of the biggest barriers to sustainability of any project is uh, running out of a resource, right? You are having a party and you run out of drinks or you run out of food, all of a sudden the party's not so fun and people leave. It's not sustainable. <laughs> if you can keep providing the chicken and the food and the music, the party can go forever, right? <laughs> I'm going to remember everything that gets talked about at these sessions, and I'm going to keep bringing it up. So don't worry about that. Um, so as, what was his name? YSA, Steve something. Steve, Steve <laughs> talked about uh, that leaving youth behind is like leaving money on the table. I think that that applies to any human resource, any human talent, any human skill. Um, and I think. Abby and Kelly and all of us have kind of referred to you all as having an, an extraordinary amount of talent in this room. So please work with me today, this morning, and this afternoon. I'll be back. Um, and, and make sure that we're not leaving any money on the table in these activities. Um, if they work well, and that's a very big if, uh, you'll all walk away with some really good strategies to solve problems that you're currently encountering but then also problems that it's very likely that you will encounter 
So we'll see how it goes. It's going to be a bit of a shot in the dark, but hopefully one that works out. So I'm a relief pitcher. I have notes. Bear with me. What I would like you to do right now, do we have the flip chart still? Yes, we do. Sweet. Let's get that out. It's like a little bit high tech. Oh, Fabulous. And what about a marker? Yes. All right. Uh, I think they're on the table. Like under the paper. Okay. Uh, same one as that one? Ah, uh, whatever. Oh, okay. I'm flexible. I'm adaptable. I'll take green. All right. So we talked a lot about talent management today, um, and I think that you're all very talented. I've read a lot of your profiles and see what organizations you're working with. I think it's high. Um, <laughs> I'm never not going to be distracted by it. It's fine. Um, what I would like to hear now, and I think we kind of touched on it in small groups yesterday, is where you each see your strengths. Um, and when we're talking about this, think about things also that are uh, maybe strengths in your home communities that might not be considered strengths here. Um, so try to try to bring your own perspectives to this as well, not just sort of the Western American sort of traditional description of strengths. Does this make sense? Yeah? So who, who can tell me something that they're good at or that they feel skilled in or that is a strength? And I don't believe that none of you think that you have any strengths. You applied to Atlas Court. You had to like literally list out your strengths. <laughs> so I know you have them. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> awesome. <laughs> um, grant writing. Grant writing. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm also learning everyone's name still. Okay. I'm going to bring you that one. Just okay. Just All right. Someone else. Tell me strengths, interests, and skills. Yeah. I'm very <laughs> You're very what? You're very buffer? And plastic, okay. I'm an explainer. Yeah, absolutely. Someone else. I'm going to make all of you say something. So, strategic planning. Awesome. Research. Someone said community. Communicator. Communicator. Social media. You said a social leader? Social media. Social media. <laughs> it's like, I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, social media marketing, if you want to be more specific. Who's in networking? Networking. networking. Math. Math. Oh, math. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in numbers? <laughs> All right. Advocacy. Advocacy. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> All right. Who has an outside of strength? Thinking. Okay. And also, I'm going to give that to you. Thinking and implementation. Thinking and organization and thinking. Uh, 
All right, who has not shared a strength or skill? Yeah, Working and coalition building. All right. <laughs> Technical writing. Planning? Planning? Fundraising. All right. Fundraising. Eva, fundraising. Fundraising. I'd say organization strategy, business development, whatever. Either or both of them. I am really good at getting other people to tell me what their ideas are. <laughs> yep. Um, Facilitator. No. Camp counselor. Yes. <laughs> All right. Tell me about your skills. Oh. <laughs> 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 Conflict resolution. Uh, what are your skills? It's more going to leadership and uh, human resource development. All right, who hasn't shared a skill so far? Meredith? What's it that my Go ahead. Uh, I guess I'd say project management, but I think that's what she said. It's all right. It's, we're not going to use that project management. There's lots of projects. There's another app. Yeah. Tell me about it. What you got, Lenore? Excel. I think we're going to have like a heads up on Excel at some point. I don't know if you've heard this about me. That's another skill. I love spreadsheets so much. <laughs> so much spreadsheeting. Who else? Love it. Yes. Uh, flexibility. Over <laughs> backwards. Adapt. Come on, interns in the back. I see you. <laughs> I an Xbox account. An Xbox account? All right. So, like, so fine motor skills. Planning. Okay. Come you go to Georgetown. That's okay. Um, probably, I guess. I know for a fact you're a really good multitasker because I've seen it happen in the office. Okay, I'm a good multitasker. <laughs> <laughs> what are some other things? You have stuff that you make me do it at this point. I think you're good at playing with my name tasks. Awesome. And deciding what you can do. So, task prioritization and info screening. All right. Data. Spreadsheeting. Data management. That's a good one. See, everyone has skills and strengths. All right. So, no answer. I think it's very clear we have a really talented group. No way it's going to stay upright. That's fine. Um, and there's a lot of money on the table in this room. Yeah, we have 
strategic planning and communications, networking, grant writing, technical writing. Really, there's no reason that if this group puts their heads together, they're not going to be really successful. Because, I mean, come on. I just felt like three flip charts. That's true. You could all be oranges or other colors or letters or numbers or whatever those personality things were, which are very relevant, but I just can't remember all of them. Um, what color were you? You weren't here. All right, let's put it out to the room. What color is on it? Gold. He's so. All right, we've got two votes for gold, man. I'm sorry, you're gold. Colorless. <laughs> okay. So we've talked a bit about the resources we have in the room. I sincerely hope I don't break this table. Um, it will be embarrassing for us all. Um, and and we've talked a bit about how, uh, like with YSA, they're really leveraging resources that are available through youth to accomplish some pretty significant goals. Um, the mission of YSA, or part of their mission, is to really engage youth in service. Um, they're pulling on resources, they're pulling on youth who have an interest, who have innovative ideas, they're pulling on adults who are willing to work with youth and sort of take that risk. They're pulling on funders who maybe initially just like the warm fuzzy feeling of supporting kids and maybe don't think it could be successful, but you know, to start, they're willing to give it a shot. Um, and they're using all of those available resources to solve their problem. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a hypothetical example, and then I'm going to, I'm going to make you guys do some problem solving. Um, so let's say my goal is to increase the Educated past the age of 15. Uh, go and do a Bible survey or do a sample survey. Okay. Maybe that you're interested in. Uh, do a primary research assessment sort of thing. Present that research to local NGOs, partners, whoever is interested in that result. And that Get some buy in. Inconsistency. Uh, identify the problem. And it can be a whole range of problems, but the finer the better, because that's where you get that, the exact ones. Absolutely. Um, find that one need, um, collaborate with national governments first, because they, they have a lot of interest. In, but 
So uh, yeah, collaborate with uh, local government, government first actually, and understand how they do it. Um, and yeah. All right. So yeah. let's say I've discovered that the the main barrier to girls continuing their education past 15 is that um, there's no employment for them. There's no reason for them to become educated past age 15 because actually they're all just going to become professional football players and they don't need to, they don't need to be educated for this. They're just going to play soccer. It's going to be great. Um, and that's the only opportunity available to girls in this community. Obviously, this is hypothetical. I don't know of any communities in which this is the case. Um, if you do, please share. Um, but, of course, not all the girls in this community are going to be selected as professional football players. There should be every, every community or every country has its local resources, which, for developed countries, they mostly are not used properly. Uh, right. My saying is that if there is a community which has resources called girls, and there is this <coughs> business, and very often they, they can't find each other. They need someone to like uh, to act as a mediator. Like that. Uh, so what you should do, or theoretically, let's say, you have many girls who can't do anything uh, except for uh, Playing soccer, uh, you first of all uh, assess their uh, talents and abilities, and also their desire to learn, I don't know, A, B, C, D skills. And if uh, some of these skills, and also you have the second assessment, probably, to uh, where these skills can be applied, be it local business, be it local nonprofit, be it whatever, uh, because every community has something. Who in the room is good at assessment? There was someone. Yeah. Hmm? Hmm. We have assessment written down on that sheet somewhere, I think. Yeah, there was someone. Who said that they, this was the strength? Yeah? Okay, awesome. So you're going to do all my assessments. It's going to be fabulous. Yeah. Assessment on both sides. Like, meet, uh, and the answers scenario. Yeah, give me, give me a scenario. <laughs> Give, give me a goal or a problem. Lack of toilets. Lack of toilets in the community. Okay. Also, like cultural pressure. I mean, beyond the age of 15, in certain cultures, you'd be pushed towards marriage and you might not want to be you know, sent out. Beyond that, anything about culture also is the culture. Yeah, but there needs yeah. to be like a cultural assessment of... Sure, yeah, there has to be. Yeah, because the sun will... Yeah. You usually don't buy a You need a sociologist. It is about this week. Yeah, first of all, you need also local expert. Because whoever, it doesn't matter how experienced you are, if you are going to a new place, and we don't know the... Uh, yeah, the details and the rules of their <laughs> so just learn something. Okay, let's hear it. I just learn something and the board kind of And there's this coalition called the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights. Mm -hmm. And she, the head, she actually promotes community assessment via the community. So the community actually gets involved. Becomes um, self assessment. Yeah, it almost is a self assessment. And there is nobody who can assess themselves better. Of course, there's some. Um, Height, uh, and some things are overhyped, but that's where an external factor comes in, and he actually checks the thing. But the community is involved in their own assessment. That's what it's pretty much. All right. So I think you should. Hang on. Hang on. There's a lot of problem ideas in the room or goals, right? We have uh, toilets, we have sanitary napkin availability, we have my silly and hypothetical suggestion of girls who only are trained to play soccer, which would be great, but, you know, <laughs> isn't real. Um, get out a sheet of paper. Write down a problem that you actually are encountering at your host organization or that you actually would like to solve. Write it down. 
So, either you can choose. Choose your own adventure day. I would like to hear from you in written form a problem that you are currently encountering at your workplace or a problem that you would like to solve. So it could be, I want girls to stay in school over age 15. It could be when I suggest ideas to my supervisor, it's like I'm speaking another language. So I would like you to write down a problem that you're experiencing in your workplace or, or a problem that you would like to solve in life, like access to toilets, access to long-term education, uh, improved sanitation, improved food security, whatever your goal is, or more specifically, if there is something that you're having that is challenging to you in your current workplace, write down that problem. You can pick one or the other. Tear it out. Just write it down on a piece of paper or borrow a piece of paper from your friends. Uh, to fellows who are watching, they should also be doing this and maybe yeah, typing them to this. you. Um, once you've written it down, fold your piece of paper in half so no one can see it and pass it up here. Uh, okay. I wanted to present this, but no. I, like, I present better when I don't write. Yeah. <laughs> Just write the problem. That's it. I believe in you. You can do this. Fold it in half so no one can see what you've written and then pass it up to the front. <laughs> Top secret. <laughs> Everything is okay. Um, so, in my example, the things that I wanted to solve was uh, increasing the number of girls in my fictitious community who stayed in school past age 15. So I can trace it either I want girls to stay in school past age 15, or I can say I see that it is a problem that girls are not staying in school past age 15. Yep. Which is great. Yes. Um, and I, I support these initiatives, um, and I care passionately about them, which is why it's an example that comes readily to mind. All right, we have some more problems or, or goals that are floating around. Yeah? This is so exciting. Are you guys excited as I am about these problems? <coughs> Maybe? You can start with doing it. Um, you know, you're going you're gonna to force me to start applying for jobs outside of Atlas Corp if you keep telling me all this stuff. Don't do that. <laughs> Just say it. I'm a free agent. Don't come to me. So I'm just still writing problems. Here we go. No, I guess we know who we're applying to. All right, these guys are still working. So we have a couple of folks that are still working. Yeah, so we do have a couple people still working, but we're going to move on because I think, what time is... Lunch start? Uh, we have, I'd say you have roughly about 50 odd minutes, and then okay. we should break lunch, and then Andy come in. Fantastic. So, we're going to be coming back together as a group after lunch. It'll be me up here again. I know you're all so excited about this. Um, and what I want you to be thinking about now, um, and maybe look to the person who's sitting next to you or at your table, um, and I want you to be able to explain to them, and I'm going to collect a couple more problems as well, goals. I want you to explain to them the problem or the goal that you wrote down. And I want for your partner to explain back to you the challenges that they see with achieving success. So if I say, 
My problem is girls aren't staying in school after age 15. Steve Panino, what would you say some things that are going to prevent me from being able to change that would be? Um, well, I think the most important thing will be uh, the cultural conditions because ch them changing cultural mindsets are almost impossible. So, cultural mindset says girls shouldn't stay in school past age 15. And how am I, as an outsider, going to change that? What are some other problems that would prevent me from successfully having an impact? Um, well, well, one of the things I think that it's, it's a big problem, at least in India, is that even when money goes in to set up the infrastructure required, there's lost due to corruption, which is is a big problem. And the other thing would be that it just it, it goes out of fact because as the officials change, the priority changes with the political scenario. Because the important, I mean, the uh, the effect of that on development is probably a lot higher than one would. So we have some some project and resource transparency issues that could yeah. could crop up. Um, Yes. Absolutely. And is a huge problem because if they're suspicious, what happens? Exactly. So, do we have roughly an even number of people ish? We either have even or odd, I suppose. Yeah? We're okay? So, everyone can, can find a group of one other person or maybe small groups of three. We'll start here with. Oh, we have one more question. Awesome. I'm excited, Lenore. We're going to do the best one. Okay. Uh, so, we're going to do a little like. Yeah? So, we have one group, the three of you, another group, the two of you. Yes, you Awesome. So we're going to do a big, massive group of four right here. Okay. <laughs> so again, share the problem that you wrote down, and then listen to your team for their feedback on what's going to make you fail. What's going to get in your way? Yeah. If I'm, what are going to be the obstacles? Uh, suspicion. Cultural norms. Uh, my goal might have been something really expensive and just getting funding at that level be a challenge. Um, maybe my plan is to go to uh, structures in Mongolia. Winters are really cold there. It's hard to build permanent structures because once the winter comes in, everything crumbles. Lots of everything, every barrier you can think of. Um, so teammates challenge the person sharing their project by really being thorough with these barriers. Don't be easy on them. It's not helpful. We talked about this um, yesterday during lunch, yeah? Like, just kind of handing someone a good reference is nice, but isn't helpful to them, right? It just sort of hands the problem off to someone else. So, thorough, constructive, tough. Go team. Go. Begin. <laughs> A lot of this is just, I mean, right now it's live because there are actually six people watching continuously. Okay. So I don't want to like disappoint them. Okay. But at the same time, like, so I we, know that I have to edit these videos yeah. at some point. So, um, the folks that will be participating live this afternoon, um, we have three, looks like laptops. How many can we have attached to the internet simultaneously? Well, to me, at the very most, that's one. And then there's two here. I okay. used to have to be online because it's coordinating the hangouts. Okay. And that one is mainly for your use. Okay. So, what I would like to do for the afternoon group is split the virtual participants into separate hangouts and then literally hand a laptop to one of the groups and they will just carry their friends with them the next steps. Okay. And then we'll have multiple smaller hangouts going on. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Is it possible? Uh, in theory, everything is, but I don't. 
I know who these six viewers are. I know there are six people on it. And I don't, I mean, right now I've been like messaging people. Okay. But I haven't really been getting any responses to any of the exercises. So I just say, like, don't focus on it. Yes. I'm going to send me your instructions to you. If somebody responds, then it's easy to just get that first one on the hangout. But I, because there's still seven spots open on the hangout. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I would so ideally, if, if they're able to respond and we can break them up, then they'll sort of participate with the group. Yeah. Um, if not, then they don't, and it sucks for them. Yeah, pretty much. But they seem to be online all the time and they're sort of viewing and stuff, which I think is really good when six of the remote fellows and all give points to that. And I've been following them. So, um, and you are supposed to read out and to know the Bible. Okay. It's right. Um, so, we will maybe take another quick break from like. Oh, oh, and people need to grab lunch. Like, you need to have food so that they're seated. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, everyone seems really like engaged with this school. They have to work with me for the next year. So, no, they don't want to be very sad. So, I think I'm a big idiot. It's going to be a little rough in the office for me. So, so I'm going to have them do this just problem mapping. Um, and then when they come back from lunch, we're going to bring in the groups. So they're going to pick some problems at random. And they're going to bring the problem. They're going to, for the thing, they're going to brainstorm roadblocks or challenges. We're going to rotate. The next group is going to come into a problem with the roadblocks. They're going to identify what resources are in the room. They're going to have to use those resources to solve the problem. Only those people suggested. Um, and then they'll have to present. I know. So that's what we're doing. Um, and I think it will use enough time. Um, if it goes early, then we can get out of here. It's and that's what we can find because we will find to drag everyone up to a gallery or a coffee shop to allow each other to walk out because I know these three, three days it would be like. Yeah, I think we're going to start Yeah, we are. I've, I've already discussed that with CBN and we'll be in the morning. From January, it's not going to be in the morning. I mean, it's, it's a very ambition that we want to end with days, but like, no, but no one is really the tradition. Yeah, but it's the tradition, so I didn't know what to do. Yeah, no, I, from I, January, I think it's, 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 it's going to change. change. Yeah. Yeah. At least I've got to change the form. January as well? This is not going to run. It's true. I know this is a happy drop down. I know. I know. I know. I just didn't think I was a sad guy. It's all right. I just like I feel like with the end of the eyes. You know that you must have a problem, yeah? Yeah, I did. I know, but no. This is this is also part of your training. You're a fellow. Thank you.
So the problem you see is that women are outstanding in the places. That there is an issue with women's safety and health systems. Your goal is to increase women's ability to be safe and health systems. What are some things that are going to prevent from achieving those goals? Right, that's what we're looking at roadblocks, barriers, and challenges. Well, she was saying from the barrier. I know, but I want you guys to say it because she knows from her perspective. I want you to say it from the
I'm more than fun. I have great
keeping all these problems and barriers in your heads during lunch, but also listening to our lunch speaker. So five more minutes. If you haven't had a chance to share your problem, do so. Thank you. You said 36, right? Yeah, 37 right now. I don't know, like, <coughs> everything, my computer and my watch is showing different times. I'll also explain why I'm doing <laughs> Like, this is the part. Yeah, my watch is Yeah, I should do that. And also, the people see there when I'm trying to run out of office. <laughs> But actually, what are they doing? Um, they, I 
I mean, I mean, men can wear whatever answers go there with them. And why can't they be in souls inside the house? For example, say, you can wear answers in the taxes and shape. As a suggestion for girls, and they're free. See, now in India, I have that kind of resources. I think we need to like spend so much money on taxes. Yeah, it is really bad. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky. All the clocks say different times. No, it is all eleven thirty-nine. All eleven thirty-nine. Okay. All right, I'm really happy that all of you engaged in vigorous discussion. Um, we solved the world's problems. I, I like that we're well on the way to solving the world's problems. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I also like that lunch has arrived. I think this is really exciting. Um, so, what I would like you to do in preparation for this afternoon, um, remember who you were to on this exercise, thank them, and then say goodbye because you won't be working with them this afternoon. I'm sorry, it's tragic. Um, and then prepare yourselves for a really interesting speaker who's coming in this afternoon whose name is? Andy Perminger of MSI. Yes. And Lachmore, you can tell us more about him, but he handles the Middle East portfolio, so that will be a different region and very interesting. And maybe also an opportunity, depending on what this person is talking about, to pitch some of your problems or challenges and get their perspective, yeah? That they're going to be another resource coming into the room. So you've challenged each other. Challenge your VIP speaker. Don't, don't scare them, but challenge them. Um, so we have about 15 or maybe 20 minutes before the speaker will start. So 15 to 20 minutes from now, you should be sitting down and ready to go, maybe eating as well. There's food. It looks delicious. And cookies, which have been discovered. Um, so yeah, break. Go, stretch your legs, wake up. Wake uh, up, get some coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where did the coffee go? Oh. Because the I don't know, I wasn't looking after the coffee. <laughs>